Well, good morning, everybody. This is Belinda Doveston speaking. Welcome to our webinar this morning. We're going to bust to pieces seven myths of high performance directorship and what you really need to know. By way of introduction, I am the uh, Global Head of Research and Development for the SADAR Group and I'm intimately involved in our directorship methodology and also the program director for our applied directorship program. So my intention today is to share with you some of the insights that we have gleaned over the many years of working with high performance boards in privately held companies and family businesses and I really hope that there are interesting seeds planted in your mind related to what your path as a director might be, what is your aspiration, and what is your next step in your path of development. Right towards the end, I will share some insights related to the SADAR Applied Directorship Program, what you can expect if that's something that intrigues you and you want to know more and so we'll touch on that right towards the end of the session this morning. So welcome and thank you for making time out to come and learn and share with us as part of this webinar. Okay, so let's get let's get to it. Let's bust, bust some myths this morning. All right, so first up I'd like to set the scene and say that when we talk about high performance boards, and we talk about what we're here to do. We love talking about this idea of good directors grow companies and great directors change lives. And this is a really important message to understand when we think about what is our purpose? What is the Sadar Group promise that we are here to fulfill? And our goal is to create meaningful economic impact. We do that by focusing on accelerating the imp economic impact of great directors and great boards and through that influence the communities that are linked to companies and through that the economies that are linked to the successful growth of companies. And when we talk about directors, we're not talking about uh, you know, the title of independent director or non-executive director. What we're talking about is the absolutely incredible opportunity that we have as directors to grow incredible companies and to build incredible leaders who create economic growth. If we wait for our governments around the world, wherever you might be today, if we wait for our governments to help uplift economies, we're going to wait a very long time. The responsibility sits with us as business leaders to make a meaningful economic impact through our contribution, through our attention and focus on what's really important as a director, which is creating value. As a director, we're not there to enjoy the muffins and the coffee, that's great. <laughs> it's about actually making an impactful difference in the lives of the people around us through the boards on which we sit. So not a light task, and we're gonna talk about some of the myths that we've uncovered in this journey of understanding what is a high performance board? What makes a high performance director? Okay, so the first myth that I'd like us to work with this morning is that being a great director means compliance and boring legalese. Now, what's really interesting is that I, my, my uncle is an accountant and whenever he hears I'm talking about governance, and we'll talk about this governance word as well, he says, what a boring thing to talk about. I said, really? <laughs> and, um, and so there is this huge idea that boards and, and governance and this whole concept is about boring compliance, legalese, that you have to be a lawyer to understand what's going on and we have a very different view. And this view is starting to grow, in moment, grow momentum in the marketplace, starting to build up an understanding of what it really means to be a high performance director. So our view is that it's not about legalese, it's about performance and conformance. For those of you who've, uh, who've heard me speak before, we often refer to this idea of this cross-country skiing as a very powerful analogy for this idea of what is a high-performance board. And we purposefully avoid the, the, the use of the word governance because it evokes this sense of conformance, compliance, and you know, SIPSI documentation. It's got that whole tick list approach to growing businesses that is the antithesis of what a board is actually there to do, which is to drive performance and ensure conformance. So imagine for a moment you're skiing, and those of you who have tried to ski, like me, unsuccessfully, <laughs> imagine your two legs being your performance and your conformance. And the way that skiing works, whether it's downhill skiing or whether it's cross-country skiing, is that 
your two legs, your two skis work together as a unit. You can't just push with one leg and slide. You'll get tired. And likewise on the other side. These two arms, these two legs have to work together and your whole body is involved in pushing left and right and left and right navigating across the terrain. Indeed, being a cross-country skier is a little bit challenging because it's not just downhill skiing, it's navigating ups and downs as well. So when we talk about high-performance boards, our responsibility sitting around that boardroom table is to drive the performance of the organization while holding the organization accountable to a much higher standard than it has ever been held before. And a lot of that comes from the conformance. So in other words, the external conformance and compliance to the external environment requirements, so that's your, your, your legal requirements, your legislation, maybe your industry standards or your quality bureau standards. And then your internal conformance, which is have we met the standards, the internal standards that we have agreed are pivotal in driving and supporting this performance ski. So when we talk about high performance boards, it's not about a legalese. You don't have to be a lawyer to sit around a boardroom table. We'll talk a little bit about what you do have to do, and there are some things that are challenging, and you have to embrace them as a director. But in terms of this myth, myth busted, it's about performance and conformance. Our second myth that I'd like to share with you this morning is that being a great director means great risk. Now, there is a saying that says a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing, <laughs> and that when it comes to the Companies Act is indeed true. We look at the new changes brought, uh, promulgated in the 2008 Companies Act effective 2011, and in South Africa it brought a massive and radical change to the way we think about business and compliance. In some parts of the world, our Companies Act, the South African Companies Act, is considered to be quite revolutionary, especially in terms of how it's codified director's duties within the Act, and secondarily, how it uh, puts a huge amount of, uh, well, the opportunity for personal responsibility onto a director, and then the third part of how it integrates through things like the public interest score, having all the types of companies and organizations within the same set of standards, whether you're a private company, uh, you know, a mom and pop shop, or whether you're a large listed company, that there are a set of principles and guidelines that bind all these companies together through the code. So I'm not going to talk about the Companies Act today, that's not what this is about. But what I do want to talk about is that there's a preconceived idea that the new Companies Act and being a director in South Africa in this day and age is a huge risk and is something not to be undertaken <laughs> and to be avoided at all costs. So yes, the Companies Act is a completely new way of looking at companies. And primarily where this idea of risk comes from is that it says here is a set of codified director's duties, things that we think that organizations, standard that organizations should hold themselves accountable to. And if you breach those, Instead of it being, uh, you know, the, the old act had criminal proceedings attached to the actual act itself. Instead of that, we're saying that actually directors can be held personally liable for reckless behavior, poor decision making, thoughtless decision making, decisions where we make decisions on a whim without supportive information. And so we as directors have to really understand what it is that we're trying to do and recognize that as much as there is risk built into the Companies Act is a lot of opportunity for remedy and lots of opportunity to be great directors and to make great decisions. So why I say that a little bit of information is dangerous, if we have a view of our legal requirements as directors, that is akin to looking into a room through a keyhole. We see only a slice of the picture. We don't really truly understand the full picture of what is going on. And so it behooves us to embrace what we're actually there to do. Now, the important thing about this, and this is why we don't talk about legalese, we talk about performance, is that the minute you put your signature on that piece of paper, the SIPSI document that says, you know, I'm a director of this company, you embrace a set of responsibilities. And unless you understand what those responsibilities are and how they drive the performance of the company that you are responsible for, in other words, to act in the best interest of the company, you place yourself in quite a precarious position, a precipice of possibility. 
yes, there are people who are starting to lose their homes and their personal asset, but, uh, asset base because of reckless behavior, because of not doing enough to make good decisions, of making decisions where it puts the solvency of the company at risk. So we have to learn how to make great decisions. The Companies Act is saying, we're trying to get you as directors to take responsibility for making decisions that act in the best interest of the company and to drive the performance of the organization while taking into account the legitimate interests of shareholders and other stakeholders. So I'm not going to go into legal, that's, my, <laughs> that's my, my compliance speech. We have a responsibility to learn. If your name is on that piece of paper, you have a responsibility. If you are a what's called a prescribed officer, in other words, you hold a position that's deemed to be as if you were a director, your name isn't on the piece of paper, but the company that will view you in exactly the same way. So really it's about learning, it's about tackling this piece of the material and embracing the act and learning. What does it mean practically? How can I use the principles of the act practically to embrace growth within the companies upon which I serve? So a really interesting way of thinking about Busting that myth, it's not about great risk, it's about knowing what you're doing. <laughs> and if we know what we're doing, we can mitigate the risk of, um, of personal loss, of personal liability. And I've often been asked, okay, so where's, where's the case law? Where, where are these guys that are in jail? And the Companies Act has said to us that, uh, you know, we're not going to prescribe criminal proceedings. We're going to hand the power over to the courts to determine the common law. And we're starting to see cases starting to come through the courts now. It's taken a while. You know, 2011 to now is quite a short time. We're starting to see the cases come through of the reality of personal responsibility and what we're there to do. Great risk, yes. Great remedies to support us if we know what we're doing. So we need to know what we're doing. Okay, so our myth number three this morning is that being a great director means loads of letters after your name. And this is something that we have, we have witnessed and experienced firsthand in the many years, 10 years of evaluating and appointing directors onto private company boards, is that you'll get someone who comes along and applies to our governance panel and has this incredible list of qualifications, PhDs, all kinds of letters, you know, the string of words <laughs> that no one understands, or certainly I don't understand. And what we have learned is that as much as, as we might be equipped with the most amazing technical qualifications, legal qualifications, concepts and, and understanding and philosophy around what business means and what we should be doing, at the end of the day, in the boardroom itself, it's not so much about IQ. Yes, IQ and intelligence and, and the study, and we'll talk about learning and, and education in, in a later myth. Yes, the intelligence is critical. We have to apply our intelligence and make great decisions in the boardroom. It, which, what makes a functional board is not so much IQ, it's the emotional intelligence of the people around the boardroom table that is absolutely fundamental. The saying goes, the fish rots from the head, and so the reverse is true. If we have a very strong board, which is like the head of the organization, if you have a very strong board of a team that is bonded in unified decision-making that embraces conflict and uh, uh, you know, views that don't always agree, but have an ability to work through that and make a decision that's in the best interest of the company. If you have that kind of environment, you have a situation where a board is mobilized and focused on making awesome decisions. And so we talk about this idea that just because um, you have this amazing intelligence, great, we need it, <laughs> but actually it's about people and it's about seeing the organization as a system of people, of seeing the interconnectedness between the board, the management team, the operational units, understanding promise, understanding purpose, and driving the organization to something that's meaningful. And that requires heart, and it requires an understanding of how we behave, how we interact, and having a high level of emotional intelligence that says, even though you disagree, I'm gonna interact with you in a highly emotionally intelligent way, and we're going to get the best out of each other. A key part of this in the boardroom is how we work with um, a tool that we developed called the Contribution Compass, which really is about raising our visibility and understanding of ourselves, what drives us, what motivates us, and using language in the boardroom that gets the best out of other people rather than just being in our own mind and driving a position home because that's what we want to achieve. It's about understanding the collective 
and how that collective is empowered through the unity of that group. So a very interesting thing to think about, how do we relate? Your ability to relate in the boardroom to each other person is as important and often more important than IQ, especially when the board has to deal with conflict, what we call the elephant in the room, the big leering thing looking over our shoulder and uh, forcing us to embrace conflict and to take those tough decisions and make them work. So IQ, but also EQ. The next myth that I want to talk about, we're going to bust this morning, is that being a great director means pitching for board meetings. And what I mean by this is there is this, this idea or this conceived idea that you're a director when you arrive for the board meeting. So you have your board meeting, whether it's monthly, uh, bi-monthly, we recommend that you never think about a quarterly board meeting if you're a private company unless you have other, other board structures in between. And so when you pitch for this board meeting, let's say every month, that that is your focus. You're prepared, you arrive prepared, you're in the board meeting, and then your job is done. But the reality is actually far different. The fact that you've signed the piece of paper or that you are prescribed a director means that you are a director 24-7. And that means the selfless service of a director is a 24-7 commitment. If you are a shareholder, or what we call the, wear the shareholder hat, and you aren't a director, you have a what we call a selfish intent. I'm investing, and I want to return. Maybe your return is not necessarily financial, but you want to return back for the investment you have made. Whereas the director position, or the director hat, is a position of selfless service. The director, if you are the director, or prescribed officer and deemed us to be a director, you sit there and you are committing to put the best interests of the company before all else. This becomes a huge challenge for directors when you wear the other hats. And we talk about this idea called the three hats of shareholder, director, and manager. In the majority of cases that we've experienced in a private company, in a family business, you know, directors are on the table wear at least two, two of those hats. And so when you wear all three, <laughs> it's really challenging because you're sitting there wearing a shareholder's hat. Maybe you own the property in which the business operates from, its premises, and you are a, you know, you're a landlord to the business. And then you sit there as a director wearing the director hat, and you sit there as a manager hat. And as a manager hat, you've got a problem that, you know, the, the rent is above, above par. Um, as a director, you have to act in the best interest of the company. So you were saying, well, let's look at other options for a rental. But at the same time, you're also wearing the shareholder hat. And your personal income is directly attached to this rental that you get from the business. And what happens if the company that you founded now moves out of the business and you, maybe you've, you've started the company to gain benefit from the rental? Whatever the case may be, you can start to see this complexity and the challenge that rises when you wear more than one hat. And so understanding the director hat is the most important thing that you could do in navigating through this challenge of the three hats and recognizing that when you wear the director hat, you sit in selfless service, not just in the boardroom meeting, but all the time. If you are a manager, perhaps you're the managing director, or you're an executive in the business, and you're also a director, it becomes a challenge because you also have a manager hat that you have to wear. So it's important to remember that you know if, if at three o'clock in the morning um, the factory is burning down, if you are a manager in the business, maybe <laughs> depending on your culture, you won't you won't get out of bed. But as a director, you're going to be worried about this building burning down because of your your selfless service and that 24/7 commitment. It's never off. It's always on. The personal liability is always on too. Myth number five this morning is that being a great director means being accountable to shareholders. This is an interesting one. And um, I really can't emphasize enough just how often I, I give this, this idea. I can't see your faces. I can't see how you're reacting. But just how often we look out across the audience and we give this, this, this speech that, you know, you're not accountable to shareholders, you're accountable to the business. And you see this shock look on, your fa on the faces of people around us. So, you know, this is the myth we're here to bust. And the story behind the myth uh, is that when um, Carl Bates was finished up writing Traversing the Avalanche, we approached Professor Mervyn King, of the King Commission fame, and asked him to write um, a review of the book or a, um, 
a, uh, a preview of the book and um, a forward, sorry, that's the right word. And um, he read the book and as an absolute gentleman in the kindest way possible, he said, uh, I'm not really able to write a forward for this book as it stands because you keep on referring to business owner and that the board is accountable to shareholders. And it was quite a wake-up call for us. It wasn't, it wasn't a pleasant experience. And he said, you go and work on these ideas. You go bring them into alignment with, with the thinking of the world and where we're going and our thinking around companies and shareholders, and I will write your forward for you. And as, a, as I mentioned, as a true gentleman, that's exactly what he did and, and graciously gave us a beautiful um, a write-up about the book and the role of private companies in growing economies. And so the story behind this is that we think that um, our, our task as a board is to make sure that shareholders' interests are, are delivered. And as much as shareholders are, have legitimate interests in the business, and we have to take responsibility for those interests, just as we would paying back a, a business loan, um, the important thing is that you cannot own a business. A shareholder doesn't own a business. They own a share in the business. It comes back to these three hats we're talking about. So you cannot own a business. And, and Professor Mervyn King says, you cannot own a business just as you cannot own a human being. So this idea, this word that we have called business owner, this term, is technically totally and absolutely incorrect. And the more we use this idea of business owner, the more we start to have in our minds this view that being a shareholder of the business we found, it gives us more rights and ownership and control over the assets than if you had a shareholding in Discovery or one of these large companies. So there's a huge amount of work for us to do to shift this idea of business owner, and it's prolific. You know, throughout the research papers, we found this idea of business owner, this ability, this idea of accountability to shareholders is absolutely prolific. And so we've got our work cut out for us. So the myth that I really would like you to challenge is every time you say the word business owner, go, oops, backspace, backspace, shareholder manager. It's a, it's a term that we've coined to describe someone who runs a business who's also the shareholder and perhaps was the founder of the business. A shareholder manager. You cannot own a business just as you cannot own a human being. What that means, that means that when you sit as a board, you are responsible for to act in the best interest of the company. You are the parent, your fiduciary duties, which is describes how a father would be expected to look after their child. That's the way the term comes from. So you have these duties and you have to govern the business on behalf of shareholders. Your primary responsibility, and this is codified in law, is to act in the best interest of the company, not in the best interest of the shareholder. And it's a massive shift taking place in thinking, and you can be part of making that massive shift. Whenever you hear someone say business owner, go, oh, no, 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 <laughs> shareholder manager. So the three hats is another fascinating process to watch the dilemma of shareholders who are managers, who are also directors, and the psychological journey that they have to go on. Perhaps this is you, the psychological journey you have to go on in delineating these hats and understanding what is the difference and when I'm wearing the shareholder hat what does that mean and director hat and manager hat and in the boardroom you do not wear any other hat other than the director hat. Now myth number six is that being a great director means having big corporate board experience. Now this ties a little bit to the idea of having lots of letters after our name or thinking that intelligence is the requirement for a board board process and so what's really important to, to remember and this comes out of what I referred to earlier of our experience of actually applying our minds to appointing the right directors into private company boards with the view of growing and accelerating the value of those companies is that just because you've had a big corporate board experience background doesn't mean that you can do that well in a private company context and I'll tell you why the reason being is that in a private company, now it depends on the size of the company and the board, but let's say um, in a, a small board you will have four directors sitting around that boardroom table. So for a moment imagine for me uh, a round circle look, looking down, you're looking down at the boardroom table, it's a round table and there's four heads sitting around this table, that table. Now in that board meeting there is nowhere to hide. <laughs> now imagine 
a different scenario, a public company board, we have a long table and you have 18 heads sitting down that boardroom table. In that kind of environment, you have opportunities, not to hide, because that's, that's in a breach of your director's duties, but to be a specialist, to be focused in particular things, into um, being maybe a research-based director. There are opportunities for you to have other specialities in a board that is that large. In a private company context, there's four of you. Think about that round table, four heads. There's nowhere to hide. Every single director, that little seat around the table is absolutely precious. And so every director has to make a massive impact every board meeting. There's a lot of pressure to do that. And if you don't feel that pressure in a boardroom, if you don't feel the sense of urgency starting the board meeting of, we've got to nail it today, guys. We've got to really push this, this boat out. If you don't have that sense of urgency and pressure when you start a board meeting, there's a problem. Okay, so in a private company, demonstrated commercial acumen is everything. We use this idea called commercial acumen to vet and evaluate directors who apply to our panel because it's so important. You're sitting around that boardroom table. You have to be directly involved in driving the unlocking of value and sustainable growth in that company. You can't, you're not an observer. You are all in. And I'm sure some of you, I know some of you heard me say this before, that if you are a director at a private company, you should get this little welcome pack as part of your, your first induction, your first board meeting, which is your gum guard and your burn shield and your deep heat <laughs> and um, knee guards and gum guard, you know, the whole, the whole thing would be a helmet because you're, it's all in. It's not a process where for the first six months you can just sit and observe. You don't have the luxury. A private company doesn't have the luxury of doing that. And you know what the difference is? The difference is that in a private company versus a public company, the, the founders, the shareholders of the organization have chosen the process rather than having the process forced upon them. In a public company, you have to have that board process. In a private company, you don't. And so if you, as an independent director, for example, are not creating value in every single board meeting, what do you think is going to happen? The first time that there's an opportunity in AGM for those shareholders to rotate directors, they're going to do it because they want to grow their company. That's why the board is there in the first place. They're a type of company that's committed to growth. That's why they've chosen to put a board in place. And so as directors, we have to bear that in mind. It's about adding value, about bringing commercial acumen to the table every single board meeting. And myth number seven that I'd like to share with you this morning says that being a great director means that you founded the company or have executive experience. Whoa, <laughs> maybe there's some of you saying, no, Belinda, this is, this, this is not right. So let me unpack it for a little bit. We have this, this view that just because we've been a senior executive in our career, that taking the step into being a director is a simple one and it's just about, you know, stepping a few steps forward. And the same is true that just because you founded the company doesn't mean you are the right person to lead that company into its next stage of growth. And secondarily, that you make a, you know, founding the company doesn't make us a great director. And so it's really about unlocking this idea that actually just because you hold those positions or you have that experience doesn't mean that we understand what being a director really means, a high performance director with commercial acumen and emotional intelligence and a level of focus and attention of driving meaningful economic impact. And so business degrees don't teach us about directorship and neither does managing a business because managing a business teaches us about the manager hat the director hat is different. And until we sit around a boardroom table with independent directors who are holding us accountable to wearing the director hat, we don't truly understand what that really means. <laughs> it's a, an experiential journey. So my own experience, having gone through the education system, and I love education, so this is not a, a knock in any way, shape, or form, but certainly you know, going through a business degree in my own career, um, you know, I didn't learn anything about being a director in a business degree. In fact, I didn't even learn anything about being an entrepreneur uh, in a business degree, which I, which I learned the hard way many years later. So there is no way for us to learn. We, there's no place for us to go where in a university setting that we learn about the practical realities of the three hats, about accountability to the business, about commercial acumen, and what it takes to wear the director's hat well, especially when we're wearing the shareholder hat and the manager hat at the same time. It is tricky. And so the myth that I want to really bust is that 
taking that step from founder to director and executive to director is not necessarily a straight line. It's not a given. There are different skill sets. They apply different types of skills. And some people are naturally gifted at taking that step earlier and you know, quickly. Some need more guidance and support to take and bridge that gap. So those are the seven myths that I want to share with you. And I hope they've stimulated some thought processes around what this thing of a high performance director is and what do we need to know and what might be the role that you could play in helping to unlock this, you know, transform these misconceived ideas about what directorship is about. It's exciting. It's engaging, it's about performance, it's about changing and transforming economies, it's about pushing our skills and abilities, especially when we have the other hats and perhaps we're in a comfort zone around the manager hat and we now have to step into a director hat, which is different, learning how to put aside the shareholder hat and understanding that well, and really working through this fascinating dynamic of the private company and what it is all about. And what is your purpose? You know, lifting the game of what the purpose of your organization is or the organizations on which you serve. So within the SADAR group, we have um, at the, the DNA of our approach to high performance boards, it's what we call the SADAR Enterprise Governance Compass. It's a model of high performance um, accountability, of conformance, of driving purpose, of driving sustainability, are four cardinal points. And in the center, those cardinal points combine to give us eight dimensions of a high performance board. And in our programs, depending on which ones you attend, we invariably touch on this, this model, a way of unlocking and creating a picture, a model of what a high performance board is truly about and what our responsibilities are in all eight facets of governance and high performance boards. And so as we go through them, we have things like strategy and direction, we have organizational culture. What's quite interesting is um, some of the feedback we often get from people is they're surprised that a board is responsible for the culture of the organization. And I'm always surprised that they're surprised. <laughs> we have things like effective leadership, developing the leadership framework within the organization and holding the organization accountable through the managing director or chief executive, which is the only direct report of a board. We have things like stakeholder engagement, you know, broadening our view of stakeholders and understanding the legitimate interests of the stakeholders around us. We have shareholder returns. You know, as much as we are accountable as directors to the company, we are responsible for meeting the requirements, the valid requirements and agreed requirements of shareholders not at the expense of the company itself, so that's always the, the catch. Risk management and compliance, you can see that's just little one little slice, <laughs> uh, whereas often we think of this as the entire picture of, of what a board is there to do, so risk management and compliance is a slice. We have financial results, which is all about driving the financial performance of the organization, and also as directors being concerned about the organizational financial model, how the flow of information through the organization, how we monitor and manage cash, things like our solvency and liquidity requirements, and really about building up the competency of the financial aspect of the business, and then evaluation and improvement, which is really about continuous development of directors, of the board, and of the organization through the metrics and the, the improvement structures and models that are put into place. We have a saying that directors should be exceptionally critical we should be exceptionally critical of our own performance. And so every board time, what did we achieve? What were the wins? What can we do better? And so as a director, we should have this mindset of continuously pushing ourselves and our skills forward. So as part of wrapping up the first part of the webinar this morning, um, I love this saying by Maslow of the famous uh, Maslow Pyramid, um, is that if you only have a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. And as a director, if we only have a limited understanding, remember that picture of the keyhole, looking through the keyhole, if we only have a couple of tools in our toolkit, we really will approach everything with the same hammer and we have to broaden our skills even into areas that are outside our comfort zones and that is really what being a director asks us to do. So on that note, what I would like to do is I'd like to move into talking about the SADAR Applied Directorship Program. There is a question that's come up that says which hat takes preference in all decisions, the board member hat 
When you sit around the boardroom, thank you for that wonderful question. When you sit around the boardroom table, when you are in session as a director, when you're wearing the director hat, that is the hat you use to make decisions. There are different kinds of decisions. A manager hat would be operational decisions. How do we implement the, um, the plan? You know, how do we monitor and implement the, the rollout of what we're trying to achieve? Whereas the board will say, what are we trying to achieve and what, what would be the measures we use to get there? What are the types of cult the, the cultural values that would support our strategy? What does leadership look like within this organization? And making decisions that create and build upon the foundation of the organization. So one example we use in one of our programs is that a, ma a manager will, um, uh, we do a board paper exercise where the manager submits a board paper asking should we lease, lease a car, this car for the salesperson, or should we buy a car? And so the, the, the trick in the exercise is that uh, a manager will ask should we do this and here's the proposal. What a board should be doing is not saying yes you should lease or you should buy, but saying we'll make the decision now, however what we want to do is put in place a policy that will help the management team to make the decision better next time around. So it's all about building the organization's capacity to mobilize and accelerate its growth, but to do so upon a foundation of great decision making. So thank you for that, that question. I hope that has helped. Okay, so this Adar Applied Directorate Program, what I'm going to do is just take a few minutes to talk a little bit around what this program is all about. It really is the culmination of the 10 years of experience we've had in uh, at the coal front, <laughs> at the front line. Of, um, of high performance boards. We don't have enough time to talk about maybe all the other myths that I, I tried to um, hold back on because it's really fascinating to observe what happens when you put a board in place in a private company, particularly where there's a founder-led business and all the psychological uh, challenges we have to go through. So bear in mind that on a, as a director on a private company board, you have to be a psychologist as much as you have to be a, a, you know, a trained uh, being able to read financial statements and you know being a generalist in all kinds of aspects of business you have to understand the people in front of you it's a fascinating process and journey and really the SADAR Applied Director program has has emerged out of our experience of that there's no way to go to get you know training that is practical so what I'm saying is you know you can study the company's act as much as you want but that doesn't make it you a high performance director what makes you a high performance director is that you have skills you have a toolkit and you have skills that you know how to apply to create and push value and so the applied director program is focused on doing that practical development of skills preparing you for the boardroom in a practical and experiential manner um, with as little theory as humanly possible so uh, a couple of key Few features about the program I wanted to share with you is that firstly there is a technical element. When you climb Everest, and you obviously have, have noticed if you're new to the Sadar group, that we talk a lot about this idea of you know the, the imagery of ascending the mountain, um, all about summiting and reaching your Everest, whatever Everest means. There is a technical part to this process of being a director. There are skills, there are there is a company's act, there are technical things we have to learn how to do. So a key part of the program is providing you with a technical experience, but not that that becomes overwhelming, just because you have to have technical background and giving you a structured you know, guideline of tackling those technical pieces bit by bit in a process rather than throwing all of them at you at once. The second part are tools. There are loads of tools. Think about your toolkit. There are loads of tools and you know, there's this huge kind of myth or misnomer that they're mysterious. Uh, and so we're going to give you loads of tools. That's what the program is about, putting all the tools into that em those empty slots on your toolkit, on your tool belt. The third aspect is experience, experiential. You know, there's no point, as I said, learning, learning about being a director theoretically or conceptually. It's actually about experiencing the challenges of what that means and experiencing what it feels like so that when you are sitting in your boardroom, whether it's in your own company or it's on a board as an independent director, that you have a reference point for the experience. And um, in our groups at the moment, we have a, an interesting dilemma of this experiential journey that our, our students are on and what they're learning. And you can see in the, in the group, there's, uh, you know, there's two groups that are mobilized and prepared and learning and, and moving forward. And there's one group that as a group are just, are, are got some real significant issues. 
And so that's part of the experience because that's actually what happens in real life in a boardroom. You have a dysfunctional board and how does that, how does that board pull itself through that and navigate through those challenges? So we're seeing in the classroom, in our sessions, the reality of what we're seeing in boardrooms. And it's very exciting to see that process, that in a simulation process that we're, we're getting that. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the simulation in a couple of slides uh, time. And then personal growth absolutely essential. You know, we've had directors come into our panel who had all those letters or try to apply to our panel and are not self-aware at all, can't explain their Achilles heel, what they're about, why they're here, you know, what their purpose is. And that's really challenging because around a boardroom table, you have to have that high EQ. I spoke about that at length earlier. And so personal growth is a key part of this program. You can't develop as a director without developing yourself as an individual. And so we focus on personal growth as a director, creating awareness, how we engage with people, how we work, um, how we, you know, how we actually contribute in the boardroom, our attitude, our diligence, which is a key part of the experiential process. Personal growth is key. And then the last part is understanding how to create impact and really about making an impact through through our work. You know, there's nothing stopping you from serving on, an, on a non-profit board, taking the skills that you've developed and going and giving back to a non-profit that you care about, or going and taking that impact into a uh, corporate space. Perhaps you want to bridge into being an independent director on a board, but creating meaningful economic impact and understanding what that really means. So we have um, 10 modules of the of the learning journey. I'm not going to go through all 10 modules because these are, are all in the brochure and we can get those to you if you haven't yet had them. They are available uh, through our website at sadargroup.com. But I want to just highlight a couple of things. There are 10 modules and each module has a session, a face-to-face -face session in a group, which is at four hours in length. So it's once a month, a four-hour session. And the idea is that it really is a doable thing for us in our busy diaries. Once a month, get together in, in a location. We're running them in Johannesburg, Cape Town, and, and soon in Durban as well. And then in between that month, there are processes of engagement. So your experience, just like being a director, is not just the board meeting where you pitch. It's about everything that happens in between. So we have an online e-learning platform that provides a variety of content and useful videos, resources, reading materials, etc., and recommended reading chapters allocated per month. And we go on this process of chipping away at really developing our knowledge and our experience and our application across a structured framework throughout the 10 sessions. So let me just go through the first three just to give you a glimpse of of what we, how we work through it. In session one, we call it the foundation session. We talk about things like what is a high performance board, different types of directors, what are directors' duties, what are expected of the duties, and the three hats of director, manager, and shield. And we get into case study discussion around those three hats and the practical realities of wearing those three hats well. So that's our foundation layer. And loads of material that support foundation. In module two, we focus on what we call the methodology module, which is about director selection and appointment and all the tools that provide the framework. So things like executive reporting, delegations of authority, the processes and tools around pre-board planning and how critical those are and things like the contribution compass, the board calendar and numerous other tools to support you, the framework of the organization. Along with that, there are two books that come with the program, Traversing the Avalanche, written by Carl Bates, which is the absolute core of the, organ of the, the learning journey. And then we also provide you with the New Companies Act Unlocked by Carl Stan, which is a brilliant resource that really simply helps interpret what the Companies Act is trying to say. So those are resources we work through in parallel. And then coming along to Module 3, it's the Strategy and Direction module. We start the eight dimensions of the SDR Enterprise Governance Compass. And in the first module, we begin what we call the board simulation process. This is the nitty gritty. Every single uh, uh, session, including one and two, there are practical experiential exercises. They form the bulk of the program. The teach materials are on the online portal. We spend the time in the sessions digging into the nitty gritties of what we're trying to do. And so how this process works is that we have a board simulation program that drives the process. 
and at the beginning of the journey you are uh, put into boards, depending on the size of the group, between four and six directors per board, and um, for the duration of the program you stay in your boards. And we have a, uh, a case or a company, um, that, or rather a market that you're part of, and all three companies play in this market, and we go through this journey of of unpacking and working every single time on doing actual board meetings. So from sessions three right to the ten, there are board meetings, there are minutes, there are board papers to be prepared from, and there are decisions that you have to make as a board. And those decisions influence the financial outcomes uh, of your company and how you fit within this market that's made up of the boards in the room with you. It's highly experiential, it's challenging and interesting I can see from the current group that just want, everyone wants to win <laughs> and um, it creates a wonderful, um, healthy, competitive environment but also a learning space where we start to see the real impacts of, of high performance directors. So, you know, I mentioned earlier some of the, some of the challenges of some of the, 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 the directors in the group. If you come to a board meeting unprepared and you haven't read the board papers, you can see the direct financial impact of those groups that come unprepared or come and, and, and it's not a full board. And you can see the numbers spewing out the end of the simulation. When you have a board that's unprepared, you have dysfunction, you have poor performance, um, and you have a tangible reality of what happens if you are, as a director, are not prepared or not diligent in applying your mind in, to act in the best interest of the company. There's a direct correlation between your preparation as a director and the financial performance of the company on which you serve. Very, very interesting. So the process is as experiential as you know, as humanly possible. We try and make it as real as possible. Um, we encourage directors to have their own pre-board meetings and to embark upon this company that you're responsible for with, with the care and love that we would expect of you as a director and to really own the process. And so for every single session, there is a set of board papers that are specifically geared to the theme of that board and, and you get to experience many of the facets of what a high performance director is all about. So that's modules one, two, ten. And of course we have we have uh, interest in companies who want to do training uh, of their board as a whole to actually run the program internally and there are opportunities to do that in a shorter time period depending on, on the needs and their availability. So the key question then is, are you ready for this journey? Are you ready to join us? And is this something that's going to create value for you in your own life? And there are, there are kind of three different types of people or directors who are drawn to this program. The one is executives and managers. So perhaps you are a, an executive um, and you are preparing for your role on a board. Perhaps you are sitting as an advisor or an observer on a board or part of your development plan is to take that next step and to get more involved as a director. Perhaps you are a prescribed officer and <laughs> that's, you know, direct the impact to you. You might not be a director on a board but you're, if you're a prescribed officer, the same learning and skills and abilities apply to you irrespective of whether you have your name on the piece of paper. So no board, previous board experience is necessary, it is useful but we assume that you're there and you're there to learn and you've got executive experience which you want to take to the next step uh, and accelerate that. The second group are what we call shareholder managers, that's the ex-business owners term I refer to. So if you are the chief executive or a senior executive in a significantly sized privately held business and are either looking to accelerate your growth and your understanding of your responsibilities as a shareholder manager or you're looking to become a non-executive on another business. This is a key area that we find is a, is, a, is a real value add and for some of our directors on our panel, they've joined our governance panel because even though they are an executive on their company they founded, they're a shareholder manager, they've recognized what, what we've been saying for many years that the fastest way of developing as a shareholder manager is to be an executive, a non-executive director rather, on somebody else's board, on a company that's completely unrelated. And they, they share this experience of every time they have a board meeting, they come back and they think, oh, okay, <laughs> I've learned something I can apply in my own business. So if you're wanting to accelerate your growth of your own company as a shareholder manager, it's a really high value add. And then the third category is what we call independent directors, those wanting to serve as independent directors on boards and are struggling to bridge the gap between, you know, being an executive and being a director and are looking for support in bridging that, crossing that chasm from one to the other, 
um, it's a fantastic way and we know that our clients highly value um, directors who've gone through this process and are equipped with skills and experience to add value from day one. So if you fall into one of those categories or are, are drawn to one of those goals, um, perhaps you need to chat with us a little bit more. So the key question is, where is your, your journey leading you? What, what does being a director mean to you of your own organization or perhaps of another, of another organization on which you'd like to serve? And we encourage you to take that step and to join us. It is an amazing journey of being a director. And um, I, having watched the growth and development of our current, our current directors in the process, it is an incredible journey. So next steps would be to complete an application form. If you're good to go and you haven't got any questions at this stage, it is on an application basis only. And I tell you why, because we are responsible to make sure that when we compile, com compile this room of directors into boards, that we know that everyone is going to create value for each other and everyone's going to get value from each other. So we have in the past um, denied applications because of um, where the person was coming from or what their contribution was going to be. Um, and so we make sure that people in the room are there to create meaningful economic impact, are there to, to give and to learn and have the right background and, and experience that means that the entire group as a whole benefits from that person being there. So it is a process of application and there's an online application form that you complete, it goes through an application process and then if you have questions I really encourage you to consider booking an appointment with one of our senior partners to um, if there's things that you'd like to talk through or you'd like to understand more and specifically there are leading up to our two um, new start dates, the one in June for our Cape Town program. There is a breakfast event being held on the 9th of June to give you a bit more of an up close and personal experience. Come and join us for breakfast, a complimentary morning with us, come and learn some more and come and meet us. So that's in June and then we have the July program in running in Johannesburg also has a breakfast event leading up to that. So encourage you to pop a mail to adp at cdrgroup.com for more information if you'd like us to get in touch with you. Pop us a mail and just say contact me, give us your cell number and we can be in touch to take the next step. Well I really trust that you've enjoyed the session this morning. We've spoken about the seven myths of a high performance director and what you need to know. It's an exciting world, it's kind of an untapped new territory in private companies and um, the more we work with with creating meaningful economic impact, the more we can create as directors, the more we learn. And so it is a journey that never ends. Our learning never ends. So please do come and join us or certainly stay in touch if you are not yet on our subscribe to our newsletter, go and do so. And um, thank you very much for your time and attention this morning. So if there's any questions anyone would like to, to pop in the, into the chat, you're more than welcome. There's a little question box where you can pop a little question in. And um, if you have any closing questions that you'd like to, you are more than willing and able. <laughs> All right, so, um, oh, thanks Nadim for your wonderful comment. <laughs> Thank you so much, I really appreciate that. Tammy got a question about what about when you generally wear have own all the hats. It's super tricky. Um, I think super tricky is an understatement. You, it sounds like, Tammy, you, you've experienced this firsthand. It is hardcore. Gum guards, burn shield, the works. So the more we can learn about the hats and learn which one we wear when and become really dexterous at ch changing between hats and holding our fellow board members accountable to not putting the shareholder hat in, in the boardroom, the easier it becomes. We start to develop a language and a conscious application of these powerful principles. So thank you for that, Tammy. Okay, any other comments? Okay, Neil says, what is the approximate take up of people who've done the ADP to find a position as a non-executive director? Oh, interesting one. So, Neil, that really directly relates to um, what the, the draw is of what people are looking for in terms of appointments. But we know that um, in our journey of appointing directors, clients who understand that directors have been through some kind of practical experiential journey of applying our principles see the value in directors who have gone through both an executive experience plus have the support of education. So perhaps what I can do is ask one of our senior partners to get in touch with you and give you some specifics and then can tackle some of your specific questions around that. But certainly uh, you know, it gives, it gives our, our 
clients a huge comfort that um, that you know there's a process, your journey. You've met a certain standard. You've met outcomes. You've committed with diligence, and that you have demonstrated a certain level of culture that you're there to create meaningful economic impact um, for their company. Um, and that you're performance managed. So one of the, the benefits of the SADAR board services process is that our clients know that we're there to performance manage the directors and that the board process is there to focus on accelerating their growth. And if it's not growing, we're, we're there to push. So yeah, that's how the process works. So Neil, I'll, I'll ask one of our senior partners to get in touch and, and take that further. Nadim says, thank you, Nadim. Um, I'd encourage everyone to come to the breakfast on the 9th of June. I've had a better understanding since. Thank you so much for that. Okay. All right. So thank you very much, everybody, for a fantastic session. I trust that you've enjoyed this immensely. What we're going to do is after the session, uh, we will circulate, we'll upload the recording from today onto our YouTube channel. So that'll be available for, for you, the Sadar Group Online, and um, encourage you to, if you know anybody who could benefit from Busting the seven myths of a high performance director, uh, please do share that link with them as soon as it is live. Thank you so much, everyone, and have a fantastic day further. <laughs>